Welcome to our November Cabbie Colloquium, everyone. Today we have Conversion Co-PI, Dr. Costas Moranis from Penn State University, who will be presenting the next installment of CAVI's Bioenergy 101 series. Unfortunately, the second planned presentation for today has been postponed for December, so we hope you can come back for that. Um, for background, the Bioenergy 101 series is a series we do at both the retreat and online to have CABI co-PIs provide a basic understanding of different techniques, methods, or instrumentation used in their research with the goal of providing a better understanding of the work being done across CABI and to promote collaboration within the center. Dr. Moranis will introduce us to genomic scale modeling today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Costas. Thank you. Um, thank you, Leslie. I hear that the next speaker is not going to be there, so you might be come at 20 minute presentation. Uh, no, don't worry about it. Um, yes, yeah, so I will give you the 30,000 feet view of uh, what we're working on in our group. I will not uh, delve in any depth on any of the topics that we're addressing. So instead, I will give you kind of a set of prospectuses. Kind of, uh, a set of leaflets that you can look at the, the kinds of questions that we can address with our modeling frameworks. Uh, I will give you some highlights, uh, some of the collaborations with people within CABI, and hopefully that will inspire uh, ideas for additional ways that we can interface with the CABI, with the CABI uh, family. So genome scale metabolic modeling. So why genome scale and why metabolic uh, modeling? What is it good for? Uh, so what we refer to it as uh, genome genome scale. Um, yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, so why is the genome scale? Because back in the early early well late nineties, early two thousands, people had the audacity to think that they can completely uncover the complete chemistry or repertoire of different organisms by simply sequencing the organism and then trying to assign functions to each one of those open reading frames using concepts like uh, homology or um, different annotation tools. Uh, so by figuring out whether the particular sequence looks like a reductase, uh, oxidoreductase, isomerase, et cetera, you can find ways of linking the different loci in the genomes with different genes and different proteins that those are, uh, you know, encoded by the different genes. And if you, this protein has a metabolic role, then you connect, connect it with a particular reaction that's part of your network now. So you start with the A's and G's and C's and T's, and at the end of the day, you end up with networks, networks of uh, chemical reactions. And those, we describe them using a stoichiometric matrix, which essentially it's an accountant's view of metabolism. It tells you how many molecules of uh, metabolite A needs to be consumed so that you can produce model, molecule B. So when we assemble these models, we have a mathematical way of representing metabolism uh, that includes uh, genes to proteins to metabolites and uh, reactions. So how do we go about putting together those genome scale models? Uh, well, there's a number of different automated tools that will do that for you online, but essentially all of them follow the same kind of uh, workflow. After you identify homologous genes, you extract reactions from previous models, you apply essentially the principle of guilt by association. Um, and then you do manual curations to see what might be missing. You look at your model and you see that there are certain places of your metabolic maps that are completely disconnected from the rest of metabolism. So what you do is that you're trying to repair those gaps by applying automated tools. After you have your metabolic uh, network, then you want to see whether the, the network can produce all components of biomass. So your microbe or whatever your organism is can produce more cells of its own. So that means that you need to identify what fraction of your organism is DNA, protein, RNA, lipids, uh, whatever the soluble pool is. And also you want to identify what is the amount of ATP that's needed for the organism to generate one mole of its biomass, uh, which is called uh, 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 ATP maintenance. Uh, so after you do that, then you apply a number of different checks to ensure that your model recapitulates the appropriate biology. And those include you knock out the gene and you see whether your model can predict the effect of this deletion, whether it is essential or non-essential. 
how you change the substrate, the carbon substrate that you're feeding your organism, and you see whether your organism can still grow. And if it does, and your model predicts that, then great. But if it doesn't, then you need to go and modify the uptake pathways or ways of linking the new carbon substrate with the metabolism. So after you're done with that, you end up with models that are typically pretty large. They involve thousands of reactions and thousands of metabolites. So for example, in our Rotosporidium uh, 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 toroloides models, which is relevant to CABI, has uh, well over 2,000 reactions. And this is pretty much uh, the size of models that we'll be looking at within CAVI, all the these models. Okay, so now you have your model, what can you do with it? And as you can see here, you can do a lot of math, right? Uh, so you can solve uh, uh, a class of optimization problems, which is called linear programming problems, which are essentially network optimization problems that can tell you uh, what can your, what, what, uh, what the, your organism may do, what your organism cannot do, uh, but they can never tell you what the organism will do. So for that, you need to do things like flux variability analysis, where you can identify what are the possible production envelopes for this organism. So those models are different than, uh, than models that you're used to that rely on ordinary differential equations. They are primarily scoping models and they rely on a teleological objective function, fitness function that you optimize. In this case, this objective function is typically biomass formation. So you assume that your organism is wise enough to apportion fluxes into the network so that it maximizes its fitness function, which in most cases is, uh, is growth. So this is the model. And now I'll move to what you can do with it. Again, I can only have time for one slide. So one thing that you can do is that you're trying to, you can computationally blackmail your organism uh, so that it has to make your favorite product, whatever that product may be, if it wants to grow. And the way that you accomplish this is by dismantling parts of its metabolism. So it will have to rely on the production of your favorite product if it wants to make every single component of biomass. And that was the genesis of OpNOC. And when you do that, you end up with an inherently stable design that as you increase its fitness, as you increase its growing rate, the, the rate at which it grows, it also makes more and more of your product. And we've done uh, work in the past to demonstrate this. So how is this uh, relevant within Kabi? Uh, this is, I'll show you one example. Uh, this is the example for overproducing 3-hydroxypropionate uh, using Isachenke orientalis. For that, we had to at the heterologous reactor that pulls from beta alanine. And we've done an extensive study. So we identify multiple ways that you can disrupt the genome of this organism. So it will have to make 3HP if it wants to grow. And you can see that pictorially in the, in the, in the picture on the right-hand side of the screen, the blue um, you know, triangular shape. Uh, if you look at the corner, the, very, uh, the corner to the very right, uh, you can see that your organism, if it wants to grow uh, it, at, a, at the maximum rate, it will have to make uh, 12 units, 12 moles roughly of uh, 3HP. So this is in essence how OpNOC works. It identifies knockouts for coupling growth with the production of your favorite product. Uh, we develop algor other algorithms like OpForce that allow you to integrate additional degrees of freedom, additional knobs that you can turn, such as uh, gene upregulation or gene down regulation. So this is the subject of another another presentation. So this is as far as um, you know predicting designs. So uh, at some point you need to evaluate those designs, and the golden standard for that is applying metabolic flux analysis. So the ones of you that are not familiar with those techniques, essentially what you do is that you fit your organism a labeled substrate, uh, for example, uh, labeled uh, glucose. Some of the carbons are 13, uh, have the R13 uh, C and not 12 C. And then essentially what you do is that you track those labeled carbons into the amino acid pool of the organism. And then you analyze those pools, see which amino acids have heavy carbons and which ones have light carbons. And from that, you, de uh, you, you re recalculate what are the paths that, that those carbons should have taken through metabolism to recapitulate this, uh, the, the mass distribution that you're seeing in your amino acids. So we've developed tools that will allow you to do the, make those predictions. Um, and uh, for example, we've worked with the uh, 
Joshua's group, Joshua Rabinovich's group, and we developed a large scale topic model that will allow you to track 386 uh, reactions through over 1,000 atom mapping matrices. So you may be wondering why is such a detail in your mapping model? Why do you need so much detail? And the answer is that if you don't have the mapping the reaction in your model, you'll never be able to find anything surprising in metabolism. So by going big, by being as expansive as possible, we can identify bypasses, non-intuitive ways that metabolism could proceed that we didn't know before. Uh, so this is what we've done for Cerevisia. And we're proceeding to do something similar for the other two yeasts that uh, Calbi is working with. Uh, uh, it's a Chenky Orientalis and uh, uh, Rhodosporidium toroloides. As soon as we have the labeling data, we will do you know, something similar. And we are in a position to do something similar also for any other organism, either plant or any other organism that's of relevance within Calbi. So uh, please let us know, we'll be able to help you. I don't want to give you the impression that it's as easy as pressing the button and getting the flux maps. Uh, many times we try to do the feeding of the data that we're given and we're finding out that parts of metabolism are not fitted well. So we go back to the experimentalist, they tell us they read on some of the experiments, they identify you know, perhaps some errors in the measurements or some incomplete measurements. So usually we have to go back and forth a few times before we arrive at uh, uh, at uh, bone-proof uh, flux maps for an organism. All right, now we have fluxes for, for an organism. What are the internal metabolic flows? How can we use those? Well, one way that we use those is by putting together uh, kinetic models. So what are kinetic models? Kinetic models are useful because they allow you to integrate omics data sets spanning from flux omics to proteomics to metabolomics. So essentially they tell, they allow you to weave a story about how metabolism is proceeding in your organism. Which reactions are fast, which reactions are slow, where are your bottlenecks, which reactions are under thermodynamic control and which ones are under allosteric control, for example. So we've developed tools that will allow you to uh, parameterize those kinetic models uh, using flux data, not just for the wild type network, but also for mutant strains. Uh, and we've done that for yeast, and we're proceeding to do something like this for tor for tor for toroidus as well. So the last part that I want to leave you with is uh, what, what about the proteins? So those kinetic models, uh, you need to input the protein levels, the enzyme levels in them. Uh, so for that, we rely on resource balance analysis models that essentially what they're doing is that they quantify the cost of assembling every single enzyme, every single protein uh, of the organism by essentially counting all the amino acids that go towards those uh, macromolecular assemblages, the ribosome cost, uh, how many ribosomes are available uh, for translation, uh, etc. Uh, so uh, using something like this, we've explained, or at least we, we rehashed uh, some of the uh, uh, observations associated with the Crabtree effect in yeast. So ideally, where we're heading towards is an integrated framework where we're going to put together both kinetic models and resource balance analysis models for, for being truly predictive, both at the flux, at the metabolite, the metabolic level, but also at the proteomic level. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Costas. If anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute and ask or put them in the chat.